The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. And then Peter here is going to finish us off. You guys don't know Peter. Um, Peter does a lot of things, but uh, Peter sits in the, uh, a lot of ACI committees, ASTM committees, goes to a lot of those things, and is uh, big in the moisture mitigation world, uh, consulting world on this issue, and he'll talk about a lot of the issues that we deal with and how to solve that problem. Thank you, Ryan. We talked about where the moisture comes from, we've talked about how moisture moves, and now we're going to talk about what those options or countermeasures that... Uh, Ned was just talking about moisture mitigation. What is it? Moisture mitigation really is a means or methods for correcting an unacceptably high moisture condition, ideally before the floor goes down or after a flooring failure has been experienced. It has to not only reduce the levels of moisture, but it has to reduce the effects of moisture. Moisture is often a catalyst to other mechanisms, particularly this caustic, high, saturated pH environment. Why is it important? Well, we touched upon it in every one of the sessions, uh, presentations today. This is a huge problem, and we've been talking about this for a long, long time. There's been some tremendous strides made, and we're going to share those with you here in the next 15 minutes. But it is estimated that the direct and indirect cost of dealing with moisture-related problems in this country is still somewhere between $300 million and a billion dollars every year. It's huge. All right. There are two approaches to it. Ned put forth what we call the pro-preemptive, but the 23rd hour strategy is what has been typically seen on projects for years and years and years, where, oh, by the way, it's getting time to put the floor down. Somebody go test the floor. You test, moisture test. It's unacceptable. Now what the heck are we going to do with it? Okay. And who the heck is going to pay for it? The preemptive strategy foregoes all that. The 23rd hour strategy, or what we call, is typically, without question, the most costly way of doing it. The preemptive approach where we can actually model today, whether it's Wolfie, there's a, a program out of Lund University called Torca S, plus the experience that has been gathered by just about everybody in construction today, you can model and determine ahead of time whether you even have a prayer of the concrete drying to an acceptable level in the project schedule, okay? Some may not take three years, but it takes a lot longer than what we ever thought to meet the levels we're being asked to meet today. So often, the strategy is either put in as a contingency or it's the system is selected ahead of time and put out in the center, okay? And like Ned said, you can get to that stage in the project where it's time to test. If you test favorably, the system doesn't get used, the money doesn't get spent. But the system is there, the money's been appropriated, and you avoid that, those terrible disputes between parties that who the heck is going to pay for. Now, when we get into the mitigation area itself, there really are two levels. Level one is the slab that is designed as properly as we possibly can make it, designed and constructed as well as we possibly can make it, but we're not. This is the slab directly on an effective vapor barrier. This is the slab on metal deck but we're not at the warranty levels for the flooring, okay? We're supposed to be at a five pound emission rate and uh, an 80% relative humidity, but we're measuring 6.5 pounds and we're measuring 87%. We're not off the charts, but we're not into warranty levels as well. There are at least 60 systems in the marketplace today. This has spawned an entire sub-industry, the moisture mitigation industry. Many, many of those systems will work on a level one system. Level two, however, is that slab that doesn't have the vapor barrier. Well, the vapor barrier is down below a layer of sand or gravel or, or granular film material, so it's basically essentially ineffective. For the level two situations, you can only 
I, I submit to you that you only want to consider systems that have absolutely no moisture or no pH limits. You get into trouble. All right. Level one, what I call the clone slab system. Here, the only moisture that we're dealing with is the moisture that had its origin in the concrete to begin with. As opposed to level two, where we're dealing not only with the free water or water of convenience in the concrete itself, but we have this perpetual source of moisture transmitting upward from the ground, as, and as Eric said, regardless of where the water table is. We get often many people lulled into a false sense of security. Phoenix, Arizona, I worked at the same, I've done work at San Diego National Laboratories. The water table's a thousand feet down. They still have serious moisture problems. Once you cover the surface of the earth, the relative humidity in a building in Florida or Arizona, the relative humidity of that slab will be 100%. All right? What other concrete subfloor determinations need to be made? Well, because in a level one situation, a lot of the systems tie their warranty to a moisture level. Okay? Please understand that any, the validity of any moisture test is only such if there is an effective vapor barrier underneath the slab. Our good colleague Howard Canary would say, this was no vapor barrier, don't even bother testing. The reason being, everything changes. If the ground is in play, and the flooring becomes the vapor retardant or the vapor barrier, everything changes. What you tested to be five pounds will be eight, 12, 14. What you thought was 80% RH will be 95 or 100. Everything changes if the ground is still in play. Okay? Level two concrete floors, okay, require systems, as I just said, that have no moisture or pH limits. Ned just talked to you about the test methods, the calcium chloride test, which has been around for decades, it actually goes back. When you get into this business, the first thing they tell you, I was developed by the rubber flooring manufacturers. The truth of the matter is that's not true. It was first endorsed by the rubber flooring manufacturers, but the actual test method in its crude form actually goes back into the 40s. Between Armstrong and Ken Pyle, very crude for portion of the test that was adopted by the rubber flooring. But Ned hit it a little and said, no, it's only telling us what's going on in the top half to maybe three quarters of an inch. Valuable piece of information, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. It doesn't tell us what's going on deeper down in the concrete. Okay? Now, I teach the moisture testing certification course in this country, and we teach the way the ASTM is written for calcium chloride moisture vapor missionary testing. But I also, on my own projects, when, I, when, I have, when I'm required to do that test, and when a moisture mitigation system for a level one slab says we warranty to nine pounds, or we warranty to 11 pounds, or we warrant, we will go in ahead of time and pre-cover the test area. We'll, we'll vacuum right the surface, which is a mandate of the test procedure, and then we will vacuum and cover that with an, a piece of rubber, uh, vinyl back, carpet tile, and leave it in place. Now I'm leaving it two weeks. Pain in the neck, what am I doing? What, what did I just do? I've allowed the moisture deeper in the concrete to rise and create a state of equilibrium, simulating what's going to happen when the floor is installed. And I can tell you without hesitation, when you take the test here in what I call the unvented manner, you will get a much higher MVER rate than you will here where it's been allowed to, to dry in the open air. Okay, this is what the flooring is actually going to experience. So if you're ever, if you're going to consider a level one moisture mitigation system that is tied to a, a low or a medium level MVER rate, moisture vapor emission rate, please consider doing testing both according to ASTM and the unmented method. Okay, concrete relative humidity testing. I just talked about this. It is the predictor, the predictor on a, on a, the, on a slab on ground or a metal deck, let's call this a five inch thick slab, okay? The standard requires that we drill to a depth of 40% of the slab thickness. 40% of five inches is, is two inches deep. When that concrete hit the ground, day one, it's 100% relative humidity top to bottom. My ambient conditions are 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% relative humidity. As Ned showed us, over the course of time, Gradually, the surface of the slab will equilibrate with the ambient relative humidity. Concrete microscopic in nature. But as you go deeper into the concrete, that amount of the moisture, that amount of humidity increases. When we come in, and again, this is on, directly on top of the vapor retarder, effective vapor retarder, when we cover the floor, that curve 
becomes a straight line again, but at a lower level. And all of the models that Hedenblad and others have done show us that that intersection of the drying curve and the redistribution curve, and we started at 100, but now we're at 80, intersects at approximately 40% of the slab thickness. So it's the predictor of what is my floor covering going to be exposed to when I cover up the floor. Okay? The revaluable piece. What are the things, what are the things that we have to determine? All right. Not so much an issue on new construction, but a lot of the projects we deal with are where a flooring system has been installed and has failed. Okay? Um, here we're harvesting cores to send to, to Ned and his people in a particular manner so that when that core arrives at their laboratory, it is in virgin condition. What I've actually done is cut a, 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 a circular piece here. We have a, a moldable sealant, non-water-based sealant. Uh, we cap it, we core around it, so when the, the cores arrive at the laboratory, they're totally protected and can be dissected in, in virgin condition. So they can look at it for a lot of things. Um, one of the disclaimers in every warranty that I've ever read for a moisture mitigation system is none of them will warranty for an ASR condition or an NSAR, near surface alkali condition. The other thing that we look for is contamination. If this floor has already had an adhesive applied to it. It's not just enough to remove that adhesive from the surface of the slab. It has to be removed from the pores of the concrete. We also look for the concentration of alkali salts at the surface. Okay? This is a slab that has been ground, and most flooring installers would consider this more than clean. But can you see these swirl marks? What does that mean? Those are marks on the trowel. If you can still see swirl marks, there is still adhesive in the pores of what would look to most people as fairly clean concrete. I can guarantee you that if a, a fluid applied moisture mitigation system will not penetrate those pores and it will blister if you apply it over that type of surface. Here's a, a former um, uh, asbestos tile system over cutback. This floor was shot blasted. You can see the texture. This is you know, blown up under the, uh, many times. It was shot blasted, and to whoever did the blasting, it appeared uh, acceptable. Except here you see the staining of the, uh, the cutback asphalt solvent-based adhesive in the pores. This is underlayment material. This is the, the PVC back of the carpet tile. Total delamination of the system because they didn't remove the contamination from within the pores of the concrete. All right, the strategies themselves. You can start over and tear out the slab. There are companies who provide commercial dehumidification services where they can, they can warm the environment and lower the humidity of the air to create that favorable drying environment that Ned talked about. You can forget about resilient flooring and consider an alternative finish. The resilient industry has lost hundreds and hundreds of millions of square feet of product sales to stain, polish, bare concrete because of this issue. Um, we've come, we, we do some wonderful things with, with, with decorative concrete without question, but I honestly believe we would never have reached the level today had it not been for this really precipitating a move to the concrete and what we could do with it. The topical methods, everybody asked me, and I brought it up when we were sitting here earlier, uh, you know, can't the adhesive people come up with a magic bullet? And they, believe me, they are making huge strides in that direction. When the government first threw the switch and forced the adhesive industry to become a water-based industry, those five-gallon buckets of adhesive coming down the production line had as much as 50% water in the bucket. Today, some of the better ones are down to 9 or 10%, but there's water in the adhesives. Everybody's bringing water in the building. Uh, we actually had dry adhesives. These are actually sheet adhesives that are applied to the back of the, of the flooring material. Call it peel and stick or glorified peel and stick, uh, but they're coming. And probably for, to a concrete audience and to, to myself and many of my colleagues, the most exciting thing that's come on the horizon after many, many years of development research is concrete that dries in less than 30 days. And we'll talk about that. Quickly, slab replacement. When does it make sense to tear out the slab? I've been on projects where between the trenching, replumbing, utilities, there was like 40% of the slab was cut out. There was no vapor barrier under the slab. I said, just take the thing out and start over. Okay? This is a project that Ned and I did, or Ned and his group and I did for the National Park Service. This is actually the vault where we store our nation's most priceless antiquities, you know, Lincoln's desk, Washington's that. 
And they had, it's a temperature and humidity controlled building that wasn't built that way originally. And the cost of dehumidifying this vault, if you was, was so exorbitant, they said, well, if we put an epoxy coating down, epoxy coatings don't breathe, and that'll, that'll cut down our, our, our moisture transfer and cut down our, our dehumidification costs. Well, they put the epoxy coating down, and it all blistered. So they took it out. They bought into putting down a, a, an applied moisture mitigation system, reinstalled the epoxy, and guess what? It failed again. So they hired SGH. SGH brought me in as a... Uh, some consultant and meeting with the Park Service people, I still remember the one comment made. By that time, they weren't particularly happy because they were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to store all these antiquities in an off-location under guard. And these people pounded and pounded his fist and said, failure is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, okay, there's no vapor barrier on the slab. We're going to tear out the floor. We're going to put in defective vapor barrier. We're going to put a new floor. We're going to dry it and you'll be able to coat this floor and you'll have what you want. Well, how long is that going to take? Well, it could take three months, it could take six months, you know, even under accelerated drying. So the, that became cost prohibitive and very unattractive uh, option when you consider what they were spending to store these antiquities off location. So the idea was there weren't a lot of loading docks. This is a vault. So we said, okay, let's leave the failed system, put an effective vapor barrier, put a, a workhorse slab that we could dry over the top, and that's how that was solved. Accelerated drying, I've, I've mentioned it several times, where these units sit outside, these are heat exchangers, basically uh, this is perforated polyethylene ductwork, where we're bringing warm, extremely low humidity air into environments that aren't that way naturally. This is a high school I did outside of Boston. Um, that at the end of school, they tore out everything except the, uh, the roof and the foundation walls. Uh, by the time we had the slabs in, it was the second week of July, they wanted to start school the first week of September. We, uh, every night, cranked the temperature up to over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, dropped the humidity, which outside was 80%, 70, 80, 90% in the summertime. We would drop it down to 30% to create that very favorable drying environment. We opened up the slab surface, and we actually got that thing dry at quite an expense. But it, uh, where it makes sense is for those of you who are in cold weather climates where it can double as your construction heat, you can accomplish it, kind of offset some of the significant cost. Alternative finishes, beer polish and stained concrete. This is one of uh, Eldon and Rick's jobs, I think, out uh, of Dallas. Thank you for that picture. Um, and again, I, I don't really believe that this, this market would have gained it, grown as large as it has had it not been for moisture related to our problems. Take it one step further, uh, grind the floor deeper to reveal this is not cast terrazzo, this is actually regular Portland, plain vanilla Portland cement factory that's been ground to reveal the aggregate and then polished and densified. Um, next time you're out in Las Vegas, this is a cementitious overlay and basically a breathable system. Uh, the same as breathable coatings. And the only problem with anything breathable, I don't care if it's carpet, I don't care if it's a, a, a coating system, when you move these boxes or these, these displays, you're going to see the outline of moisture. If there's not an effective vapor barrier under that factory, you'll see the outline of moisture and quite likely the, the, the traces of the white deposits, which are soluble salts. It's funny how a lot of projects you can go in, and this particular school out in Ohio, you know, you, you walk the corridors, commons area, all the floor was failing miserably, but you walk into the, the, the boys' room or girls' room and, and the ceramic tile, the porcelain tile, the ceramic, uh, quarry tile, it's fine. Why? Because it's not set into a water-based acrylic adhesive. It's set into a cementitious thin set, which has far greater moisture-resistant capabilities than do the water-based adhesive. So, the state of Ohio decided they would forget the resilient flooring and put the quarry tile for the whole school. It worked very well. Topical methods, moisture suppression coatings. 90% of the moisture mitigation systems that are being used successfully today fall into this category, or those that basically are preformed systems, they're venting systems that allow moisture to diffuse within themselves or in an airspace. You see these typically in sports uh, complexes. We now actually have a new ASTM standard for uh, two component um, resin based topical moisture mitigation systems, ASTMF uh, 3010, which was just released this year. Uh, surface preparation, whether it's new construction or whether it's existing, is, is paramount to success. 
Uh, some systems are single coat, some are double coat. In this case, what you're seeing, the, the, the finished product, that's the mitigation system, but they've now added a cementitious layer that we refer to as, as a blotter layer. Sometimes you put the cementitious layer over because you need to level the floors, but the most important thing when you're dealing with water-based adhesives is that now you've got a dense surface. You just put an epoxy on the surface of that concrete. Okay, if I'm laying VCT, I can spread adhesive, I can stand back and I can let some of that water evaporate, okay, and then set my tile and roll it. If I'm setting sheet goods, I don't have the same luxury. I have to send me wet set or wet set that sheet good with its rubber, linoleum, vinyl into that adhesive. If that surface isn't porous, where does that free water go? It doesn't. Everything looks great. You put it down, you roll the floor. Next thing you know, they're bringing gurneys in or they're bringing carts. You start to see the wheel marks and you start to see the indents. Then you start to actually see the trial mark because that adhesive never reached the degree of cure set that it needed to. So what do we do? The mitigation system goes down and we put a cementitious layer that can act as a level of, but it's really a blotter so that the, the free water in the adhesive has somewhere to go. Okay. Single component systems, two component systems. I, I tend to prefer two component systems because when I shot blast the floor, I create what's called an anchor profile, an exaggerated mountain range, if you look at it under my microscope. When I put a single coat on, most of that coat fills the valleys. Okay? I like the idea of putting a second coat on to get the mill thickness that I want to get the permeates down to the level. And by the way, the, stand, the ASTM standard requires that the permeates there is a specific permit that these systems have to meet. Bar gas, sand, and now the leveling water course. Freeform systems, these, uh, uh, as I said, allow moisture to wick or vent or diffuse within an airspace or within the material itself. You see a lot of these in the, in the sports floor industry. The hybrid adhesives, um, ever since the, the government threw the switch back in September 1999, adhesive manufacturers have been trying to find the magic bullet. Uh, this is a hospital outside of Boston where the plank is just, this is the waiting room. Planks are just swimming off the floor. I mean, absolutely swimming off the floor. So we vacuum around the test area and applying the adhesive. And as we get the luxury with some of our clients of doing these tests and watching this. It's now been down for a couple of years. We are starting to see a, a few drops of water. But I tell you, it's, so far, uh, it's worked famously. And one of the attractive things about this and the pre and the sheet adhesives is I can put a plate up this, I can put a facility back in business overnight. Or some of the other systems are multi-stage systems that might require anywhere from two to five days. And the attractiveness obviously to clinical operation being able to put them back in business the next morning is it certainly warrants every consideration we keep. So we're watching this very closely. They're not they're not there yet, but they're getting very, very, very close. Okay, the pre, this is the, uh, the sheet adhesive, and what happens here is the, the flooring choice is selected. The flooring actually gets sent down to this company who applies the sheet adhesive. Here's the floor after preparation. It's a very special primer, okay? and you've got to be good to do peeling stick sheet goods. It's easy to put a peeling stick tile, 12 inch tile or 18 inch tile. You've got to be really good, but the hospital hired their own crew, and so far this has been down for a couple of years very, very all right, and now what I think is going to change, a real game changer. Uh, I've had the privilege of, of being involved in, in the testing phases of the development. Uh, Ned did the, the final validation testing, rapid drying concrete. How does it differ from what we all know as, as conventional plain vanilla concrete? Well, the trick here is that it has to place finish and pump like plain vanilla concrete. My mentor, many of you know, was a stodgy old German engineer by the name of Hermann Proz, the third, former worldwide technical director for uh, W.R. Grace. He was a professor at Wentworth Institute. Hermann designed a concrete mixture 20 years ago that dried in 36 days. And our dearly beloved uh, deceased friend Manny Manos and DNM Concrete um, were enlisted to place this concrete. And had Manny not been a very dear friend of ours, these guys were packed up and walked off the job. It was the most miserable concrete anybody ever tried to play. So the challenge has never been that we didn't know what we could do to get it to dry quickly. The challenge was what can we do to get concrete that dries quickly, that plays, pumps, screeds, and finishes 
as close to the claim of factory as, as, as we could possibly get. Okay, as well as dry tests, a calcium chloride test, um, an RH test in a certain amount of time. Conventional concrete, on ground or on deck, it can only dry from one face. It's dry from the top down, which means it's totally dependent, as Ned showed you, on what its ambient surroundings are. It's going to equilibrate with its surroundings. And unfortunately, it's, and, and, and as evidenced by everybody here, we all know, it's seldom is it occurring within the project schedules that we are living with today. So the secret here to these the new rapid drying concretes are self desification a European process where not only do you lose a little moisture to the atmosphere from above, but it's consuming that free water internally. Okay? So you're getting uniform drying. And I'm going to show you the, the secondary benefit to this. Here's the drying curves from the first studies where in about 30, I can't really see, for 30 something days, it got down below 3 pounds. The relative humidity was down below uh, 75 in about 32 days. And this, by the way, was an extremely low uh, water cement it was a 0.44 control, it wasn't even a 5-0. But here's the secondary benefit. Because this concrete is consuming the free water internally and not losing it, it's not losing volume to the same degree that conventional concrete is. So on the curl tests that were performed, you, you, we've got up here a few thousand, and basically flatlined where the control concrete continued to curl over time. So not only are you in concrete that dries quickly, but you're in concrete that it's going to stay the way you left it when you place and finish it. In conclusion, the, summer, the mitigation system has got to be capable of reducing moisture at the interface, and it's got to be able to survive. Because now, if on those open slab systems level two, it's going to be 100% relative humidity. It's going to be saturated, caustic, at that interface between the concrete and the underside of the adhesive or the mitigation system. A few words about warranties. Um, I tell my clients all the time that, um, and that painfully, the truth of the matter is, and I don't mean to insult any manufacturers, but you learn after a while that warranties really are more written to protect the seller than the buyer. And the seller gets a good feeling out of it, but you've got to be really careful. So, like I tell my client, forget about warranties. Ask yourself one question. Forget about the warranty. And it's good to know you got one. Ask yourself this question, can you afford this floor to fail? Failure is not an option. All right, make sure you know what you're getting. <laughs> now check this out. This, is, this one next one is a sign from a construction site. Caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of the sign. Oh, look down here. Oh, by the way, the bridge ahead is on. <laughs> The whole point is make sure read the fine print of warranties and, and don't 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 hang. I hear it all the time. They promised us this. I said, no. Can you afford this floor to fail? The warranties sound wonderful. The promises sound wonderful. Make sure you know who's behind that warranty. Do they have the money to stand behind it? Yada yada yada. All right. Put it all together. It is. We are having success. We're having much better success. The size of this audience about. A uh, third of what it was 15 years ago, so hopefully in the next five years we won't need a hot topic session on this. Uh, so uh, thank you for your attention and we'll be taking questions, I believe, after this. Thank you.